can start. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our TMS talk season three. Uh, so first we're gonna acknowledge all the uh, people who contribute to organize this event. Um, thank you guys for your effort. And uh, uh, today we uh, are very happy to invite uh, Dr. Yuan Bo Tang Pani uh, to give us a very exciting and uh, uh, very inspiring talk. So uh, I'm Hao Chen Kuang, I'm Hao Chen Quan. I will uh, first briefly introduce our agenda. So I will basically introduce the, our uh, Martless Society. And then I will pass, uh, I will also introduce my co-host Shao Lu Wei. And then uh, Shao Lu gonna introduce our speaker, uh, Tony. And Tony will give us his lecture. After that, we, you, uh, the audience can raise your hands to ask questions and we can, we can have more detailed discussion. Okay, so first, I'm gonna brief, uh, briefly in introduce the Martless Society. So the Martless Society is a nonprofit community for young scholars to freely and equally build connections, prom uh, promise uh, their work and share their thoughts. We mainly have four types of events. The Martless Talk focuses on sharing knowledge, scientific research, and the popularization of science. The BBA Talk is about sharing the stories in the world beyond academia. PMS workshop is to help young scholars develop their uh, diverse skill sets. We also have special issues to invite guests who usually share their career stories that may inspire our young scholars to think about different career paths. Today, I'm very happy to co-host uh, Tony's talk with uh, Shaolo Wei. Shaolo is currently a PhD candidate in Department of Computer Science and Engineering at, at MIT, supervised by uh, Professor Tassen. His research uh, focuses on uh, physical metallurgy, especially studying phase transfer, uh, transfer, transformations and the plastic deformation of uh, various metal materials. His work has been published on many high impact journals, including uh, Nature Materials, Acta Materialia, Scripta Materialia, etc. So now I will pass to Shao Lu, and Shao Lu, you can introduce our speaker, Tony Yuan Bo Tang. Okay, great, great. And uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Chen Ying for your kind invitation and for organizing all this uh, beautiful poster and the promotion of the talk. And I'm Shalo, uh, currently a PhD candidate at the materials department of MIT. And today is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Tony Yuan Bo Tang, who is currently um, postdoc researcher at the materials department of Oxford. Uh, Dr. Tang got his bachelor degree in material science and engineering at the Imperial College of London before he moved to the University of Oxford, uh, pursuing a doctoral degree in material science with Professor Roger Reed, specifically focusing on the development of science and technologies in superalloys, which many of you know is the most crucial part of engineering uh, engines and also um, high temperature structural components. And Dr. after getting his PhD degree at the age of only 24, Dr. Tom moved on to um, study more about superalloys and, and become a chartered engineer more recently. And I think in this talk, uh, Dr. Tom is going to give us a brief introduction and uh, focusing on the development of superalloys and discuss the most exciting development in the, in the science and technologies for this cool material that has been made to be hot. And I believe this talk will be around uh, 40 minutes. And after that, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have question during the Q&A, you can unmute yourself and ask the question to Dr. Tang. And I think uh, Dr. Tang now is uh, all yours. Okay, thank you. Let me try to share my um, screen. Everyone, can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Yes. No, that's good. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Tony. Thanks very much for the um, invitation and the kind introduction. Uh, by Shalo, by Hao Cheng, and by Jen. So today, I am very excited and thrilled to take you to the journey of uh, developing, uh, developing super alloys. 
this is basically um, a class of material that is very unique and it's basically my original motivation to do a PhD um, and eventually now escalated to my um, academic career. So in the next 45 minutes, I hope I can convince you this is a subject of importance and, and also hopefully this is an interesting one as well. Um, how do I, okay. So this is the um, structure of my talk. In the beginning, I'm going to introduce what is a super, uh, super alloy and why we really um, bother about it, what do we care. Um, as it is an alloy that is used in very high temperature applications, then I'm going to invite you to think like an engineer, what kind of considerations you have to give for high temperature um, applications. Once you know what kind of properties you need, then the question is how to design, develop, and how to manufacture and qualify uh, your materials. Then we probably can reach and um, to address the question why it is still very challenging to um, design super alloys. Of course, uh, we have a very rich history of development of eight years, some people argue 100 years, what have we really learned? And the important question to ask is, can we really use um, those kind of knowledge uh, we have built up over the eight years to actually to, to help us with, um, to iterate the process faster for some future technologies, such as additive manufacturing that is emerging very, very quickly. Right, so this is, I'm going to show you one of the typical um, application of um, nickel super alloys, which is the um, jet engine um, of, of um, airplanes. So this is basically provided by Rolls-Royce. And you can see how it works is um, in the beginning it sucks in the, um, the cold air by the fan blade. And then the cold air is going to be compressed into uh, those different stages of compressors made by titanium, where this is um, compressed air gases is going to be mixed and ignited uh, with the, um, the fossil fuels and they're going to be, be uh, burned um, in, into exhaust. And those exhausts are going to turn those turbines uh, into moving and the turbines are connected to the shaft that is going to uh, make the fan blade um, spin even faster. Basically, this is the, um, um, the place where, uh, where we use uh, super alloys a lot. And you can see um, the conditions for uh, super alloys are going to be very, very hot. Apart from jet engines, we also have some other places we have to use uh, this class of materials, such as um, nuclear reactors and steam power plants, uh, when you have to have some very gr uh, great uh, corrosion resistance. Other type of um, applications include heat exchanges when you have to have um, um, fast uh, cooling or uh, industrial gas turbines and also uh, very exciting uh, research and engineering applications on rocket engines and hypersonic vehicles. So if you look at the um, development of super alloys is always been driven by the very high temperature demand and you can see that um, the very important criteria called the turbine entry temperature is basically um, increasing over the years. You can see that is from um, around 1000 Kelvin and now is increased by about 800, 900 degrees um, uh, to, to, to now it is more than engines. And the reason for that is really driven by how this engine works. It is, um, de it is be defined by, by these thermal efficiencies um, that you can achieve possibly in, in each engine. And the higher temperature you can uh, afford it, then that means the whole engine is going to be more efficient in terms of um, thermally, uh, which is going to save you a, a bit of, uh, more energy and fuel, and that is going to be uh, a bit more sustainable. This is not only achieved, of course, by the materials um, development, it's also achieved by the effect of uh, using of uh, cooling technologies and coating technologies that you can see in, in the end, we already have exceeded um, the, the melting point of the, of the material, but actually because of the effective cooling that it has and also the very um, uh, big jacket it has uh, as coating, so the material is still doing fine. Um, another word about 
the development of uh, super alloys, this is also strongly influenced by by the wars as well. If you look at the um, the time um, of of um, of the start of the development. And of course, this material is not a very uh, light material, and it's going to be flying on the sky. It's, it's actually inf quite heavy. It weighs about two tons in an engine. Uh, that is roughly about uh, half of the, the, the entire engine. So now is the, um, the, th the thinking about um, the high temperature problems, uh, what kind of things we're, we have to solve, we have to consider. This is a typical working condition that you can be uh, considering for a, a high temperature application. Um, of course, it's going to be high in temperature. It's going to be high in, in the stresses as well that is uh, exerted by the centrifugal loading. The material is also going to experience a lot of dynamic loading as well, such as fatigue. It can be low cycle, high cycle, ultra high cycle, or sometimes uh, thermomechanical fatigue because it's in a such high temperature, and also you're exerting all these um, exhausts from from burning the fuels. It's going to be a very corrosive and oxidative, uh, oxidative uh, environment as well. So these environmental degradation has to be considered as well. Most importantly, uh, the primary focus uh, over the past years has been the uh, crit performance, which is the major consideration. I'm going to uh, explain a bit more in detail next slide. But if you put those conditions together um, for a more than jet engine uh, turbine blade, sometimes it's equivalent of loading like 25 SUV cars from, from a blade. And the blade size is just smaller than my, than my hand. And you have to load it in hot and you have to load it for many, many years. So that is basically quite great. Of course, the properties we need is to have um, its ability to, uh, to withstand load um, close to its melting point, has to be crib resistant and tolerant to extreme environment. But because the development has um, turned from military based to more civil based, so we have to add in some other considerations as well. For example, the density of the material, how ductile it is, um, if, if we really can afford the cost and there, there has been a lot of material that is available on the uh, planet Earth, how long is gonna degradate uh, in terms of the microstructure and most importantly, can we really make it easily? So this is the uh, demonstration about the crypt deformation, which is a uh, key to um, jet engine technologies. The creep is basically an inelastic, unrecoverable, time and temperature uh, dependent deformation with a constant load, usually um, uh, in, in very high temperatures. And it's governed by this equation in here, which is a Arrhenius type. Uh, you can see that is a strong function of uh, temperature and activation energy as well. You can convince yourself by doing such an experiment in your home by buying some solar material because this melting point is essentially quite low in room temperature that is already exceeding uh, 0.6 of its uh, absolute melting point uh, in Kelvins. If you just hang those solar materials uh, on the wall or anywhere by its own weight, over the time you can see by your eyes um, how it is changing. And if you have a hair dryer, it can, it can increase local temperature and you can see um, this, this process becomes a lot faster. If I invite you to think like an engineer from 100 years ago, uh, you wouldn't think about nickel in, 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 in the first sense because there are a lot of materials that are available. And also, um, you know, that was basically the, the, the era of uh, steels. So nickel was one of the front runners. And there are also a lot of um, things developed in, in austenitic steels. And to be frank, it wasn't very, um, um, very super until um, sort of accidentally that some aluminum and titanium were added in into, um, uh, into, into nickel uh, that was done in 1929. However, um, after you pitch in aluminum and titanium, you can see um, the creep resistance for, for nickel alloy has in, improved just dramatically completely um, a different material. So people started to get, get interested to it. And the, the term of super alloys, it didn't really become really, really po uh, popular uh, until the end of the, uh, the World War II. So if you take um, these materials and different type of materials, alloys, and if you compare their um, specific strength in a very crude way, you can see titanium and, and steels are, um, are 
quite strong, but their, their strains can degradate very quickly after around about 500 degrees. This doesn't really happen to nickel. Sometimes it can, it can even be stronger in about 750 degrees than it's in, in room temperature until it decreases um, um, strength. Here I show you some of these um, uh, early uh, candidates of material that is either iron based, which is steel, or nickel based, um, some, some, some alloys. And they can be consist of um, iron, nickel, chrome, aluminum, etc. And, and interestingly, I found the other day, if you look at the compositions in, in this uh, K42B, uh, which, was, um, which, which was available in, in 35, the composition is quite interesting. It's got quite some bit of um, iron in there, a lot of nickel in there, um, uh, quite an amount of um, uh, cobalt and, and chrome in there. So in, in some contemporary um, senses, some people might want to call it as a medium entropy alloy or even maybe high entropy alloy. Another fun fact um, that uh, if you compare um, the date or the year uh, when they were um, first around, you can actually see it's even earlier than Superman's first appearance in 1938. So who was super first, right? Here is a uh, fairly comprehensive list of um, reasons why nickel were really uh, selected for the high temperature applications. It's got a very favorable uh, crystal structure, which is FCC, and there's no phase transition to, to its uh, melting point. It's tough and ductile, and most importantly, we, we mentioned, it's important uh, for, for it's, it's great doing uh, in, in terms of dealing with creep and diffusion type of uh, um, uh, activated process. Although it is not, you know, the absolute best, including iron or tungsten or some niobium or the other uh, type of oxides, they can do even better. However, they have other problems. Um, Nick, uh, for example, the BCC alloys such as chromium, they are quite prone to, to brittleness. Titanium, iron, moly, etc. They are very prone to oxidation and, and phase stability problems. Cobalt can be actually also made as a uh, uh, as a super alloy, and it has actually been uh, researched quite intensively as well. There are some applications of of, of cobalt super alloys, but they are um, um, not as uh, popular or commercially uh, available as, as nickel ones. And the other materials you can see, for example, uh, platinum and platinum group um, alloys, they are just too expensive and too rare. So in, in short, nickel is the most well-rounded candidate in terms of a balance of properties. But I would like to also to draw your attention that research has never really stopped um, exploring the materials that can be used to do the job. For example, cobalt-based super alloys are very, very uh, important. Uh, refractory based um, alloys or now refractory based high entropy alloys, um, they are quite important as well. They were really big in the 50s uh, until they, they died completely. Um, tungsten moly based alloys are also popular. Ceramic, ceramic used to be one of the futures as well um, until about 20 years of research and, and that didn't really pay off. Intermetallic material as well, but they, they were um, unfortunately not as uh, po popular and, and commercially um, successful as nickel. So we know what we need. So let's, let's try to think about how to design and, and, and make them. There are many major eras in the past and uh, in, in terms of super alloys development um, that include uh, the alloying development and this, this also includes a process development. The process development is basically using different ways of making, um, making super alloys. For example, powder metallurgy, you can do it by rock and cast, you can do investment casting or uh, for example, single crystals. The alloying development is basically to develop a composition of, of the material that is going to be suitable for uh, for, for a particular process. And as you can see over the past many, many years, um, what we have really learned from here is basically it takes, um, it takes a very good alloy to, to really um, get most of it from, from, from a particular process. And that can take some years. 
to put this into layman language that everyone would understand immediately is alloying development is basically you're changing the ingredients. In this case, is you're changing how much nickel you're putting up, you're, you're adding in, how much chromium you're adding in, how much aluminum you're adding in. And the processing in here means the equipment and the recipe, which means you're going to use uh, forging or you're going to use casting. And the important thing is, the bamboo steamer, for example, can never really work well with a bone <laughs> T-bone steak. They are just not the best combinations, and I, I, I will never, you know, barbecue grill my uh, Shaolin bao either. So the important thing is they have to match. So in terms of alloying effects, which is uh, about the microstructure of the nickel super alloy, you have to think about um, what it really consists of. So this is a typical microstructure of nickel. Uh, is a, is consists of, for example, gamma matrix, which is an FCC uh, FCC phase, and a gamma prime um, phase that is really important, imparting most of the um, strains um, in, into this nickel, and also some carbon boron phases and and other possible uh, other possible phases as well. So for gamma phase, that is a matrix phase, is basically a disordered uh, phase in 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 you can solve a solution uh, with different sort of um, um, alloying elements. And you can also improve the creep um, re resistance of the alloy by alloying, uh, for example, rhenium, moly, or a tungsten into it. Of course, you can also improve the environmental resistance by adding chromium. These are all the uh, gamma stabilizers. For the gamma prime stabilizers, is it's different. It's going to be aluminum, titanium, niobium, or tantalum. It's, it's, it's a ordered phase, so you have changed the um, ordinary uh, <laughs> uh, Bergs vector uh, for 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 dislocations. It becomes uh, there there is a um, there is a strengthening by by um, creating antiphase boundary penalty uh, energy penalty, and also it is basically precipitate. So you can strengthen it by uh, by precipitation hardening. But of course. The ordered strengthening is not really a, a big news in, in metallurgy at all. Um, for example, in copper alloys or aluminum alloys, we also have something similar um, as, as those uh, type of um, ordered hardening. But the different unique thing that nickel has is how much you have it. For a modern um, a jet engine turbine uh, blade, you can have up to about 75% of gamma uh, prime phase, which is the intermetallic, which is really, really a lot. And of course, you have to consider about the green boundary characteristics and what you have in there, for example, the carbide and boride, because you have to make them uh, suitable to, to improve the green boundary strains and, and the overall ductility most of the time. And of course, if you don't do, do this correctly, uh, it, can, it, can, it can affect adversely as well. Other possible phases such as gamma double prime, which is a desirable phase when you want to have very high strength, such as in canal 718, uh, then you put a lot more niobium in there. But the other phases, for example, delta, sigma, TCP phases, they are usually uh, detrimental and you, you have to avoid by adding too much um, to, from, from over alloying. And you can see this is a schematic of how the microstructure has developed over the years. In the beginning, there is no gamma prime, only some carbide, and then there are some little bit of gamma, gamma prime. As you add in more um, alloying elements, you have uh, just bigger and bigger gamma primes, and there are in, in higher um, in, in higher sort of uh, one fraction as well. Sometimes, if you don't do it right, you can have eutectic. Uh, that it forms, you have to homogenize it later. So the overall trend is we have basically imparted from corrosion resistant alloys to more and more um, creep resistant alloys. And by doing so, we have we have basically just keep on increasing the gamma prime uh, volume fractions using alloying. This is a uh, fairly comprehensive um, table to show you um, what the alloying um, effect of each, each of the, the elements. I'm, I'm not gonna go into details, but I would like to draw your attention just for, uh, for a quick example. Let's say titanium in here. So titanium can do something to the matrix strengthening, but not too much. Basically that is something even uh, negligible, but it does increase the gamma prime fractions very dramatically because that is the gamma prime stabilizer, which is needed. 
Also, we can uh, strengthen the green boundary sometimes by titanium carbide. However, if you add too much of it, or even actually if you, you add a little bit of it, you are going to compromise a bit of um, oxidation resistance uh, as well. So all of these elements, they can do something good, but actually in the, in the end, you have to consider very carefully, but balancing the other properties is going to bring it uh, uh, bring it back. For example, uh, corrosion oxidation resistance or density or um, TCP phase transformation, that these are just something you, you, you would like to uh, avoid. If you look at the number of elements, you can be also surprised by how many things we wanted to add into a nickel alloy. And that is usually about 10 elements for a typical alloy. Sometimes it can go up to maybe 15 different elements in one particular alloy. So, so a lot of the synergetic effects are, are, can be exerted because the phase transformations are are, 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 are determining, uh, de determining that. So we, we, don't, we, we can't really expect a, a brute force method to test all of these possible compositions because the design space is just so vast. That was a lot about how to make an alloy, how to, uh, what to be added in into, into the alloys. And now let's think about how do we actually make them? One way that is very popular, and it was also from the ancient times, is you, you cast and rot it, which means you, you have a hammer and you bang, bang, bang. It goes on just uh, hitting on it. Most of the cold weapons are done in this, this way because the, the, the properties are going to be quite excellent. And you, you, by doing so, you're also triggering the, uh, you're making the materials to, be, to, to, uh, to become quite homogeneous as well. However, um, cast and rod material can't really be used for all the applications. And the really big hindering uh, factor um, are actually, well, actually two factors. One is it becomes more and more um, harder to, to make high gamma prime uh, fraction alloys by this way. So these alloys are used for relatively lower temperature but higher strength uh, requirement uh, components such as turbine disc. The other important reason is actually if you go bang, bang, then you can never make a hollow or it's extremely difficult to, to make a hollow with, with subsequent uh, machining. So that's, that's why uh, we, we have uh, used it for the turbine disc applications with, with uh, cast and raw materials, but not really the turbine uh, blade, which re requires about uh, higher temperatures. For making turbine blades, one of the important uh, development is something called investment costing, which is uh, as simple as, as it shows. In the beginning, you have a uh, wax, pa uh, wax pattern uh, assembly and you dip it into slurry, you invest it, and then you put coat it with higher, uh, bigger, coarser uh, ceramics and you do this process many, many times until you have a, a big shell. You fire it, you wax it, make it harder, and the wax is going to be uh, lost from, from the bottom. So you, that is also called the loss, uh, loss wax uh, process. Once you have the ceramic core, uh, a, 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 a ceramic mode, you can pour your materials into the cavities of them and, and, and then they can be solidified in this way to, uh, to make your material. Um, as it develops, you can also do a bit more interesting things about uh, controlling exactly how you want the microstructures to be. Uh, such ways are called directional solidification, and then this evolved to um, the uh, very important development of single crystal casting. What it does is basically you are solidifying the material directionally because we found there is a tendency of one zero zero axis to grow parallel to the um, axis of, uh, of heat flux. So we can use this to design um, a material that is quite anisotropic and quite likely which is determined by the nature, um, the one zero zero orientation is usually the strongest um, orientation in creep. So we are, we are safe. And of course, um, for, increase, for, for making single crystal alloys is similar to the um, directional solidified, but you have now something different, which is called a pigtail um, or called a, a grain selector, where the grains are going to be uh, growing by this uh, grain selector in the, in initially, and these are very aligned to the 001 orientation. However, 
um, you can the the, the fastest growing uh, grain is going to eat out with with any other um, uh, other orientations. So in the end, you're going to just left up with one uh, orientation, and you can cast the whole material um, into into such a blade. And the whole material, apart from the bottom bit, is made by just single uh, one crystal. Therefore, it's called the single crystal casting. In this way, we have solved a lot of problems. Uh, one important thing is the creep. As you can see that equi-ass grains, which is by conventional casting, the richly solidified material, they have aligned grain boundaries and also the grain orientations of a 001 or a single crystal, so you just remove all the grain boundaries. Therefore, you can test their creep strains. They are quite different as well. Uh, the conventional cast material has got uh, about 30% uh, of the uh, single crystal in this, in this case, which means the single crystal has really paid off uh, for the creep properties. And the reason for that is really we don't like green boundaries very much in high temperatures because they are the source of failures. Uh, the voids and, and cavities are, are quite prevalent. And I, I can show you here by uh, one of my experiments on nickel alloy um, in situ SEM or deforming this alloy in um, in high temperature, which is around 700 degrees C. And you can see all those failures are along those uh, green boundaries and they, they are just, just basically uh, are linking up and, and causing problems. And this is a slightly higher uh, resolution of, uh, of, of the same graph. You can see how they developed um, as you pull it. Another very important aspect for single crystal casting is what we promised as, um, as cooling. And to do that, again, this is not very straightforward. You have to have a sacrificial, sacrificial ceramic core. You basically embed these um, ceramic cores in the wax patent and they are going to be um, cast together with the blade which they have to be leached out by strong alkali or acid uh, in ultrasonic sound. And that, that is going to be a, a very long process. Once you have your material leached out, it's going to be heat treated or let's say homogenization treatment, um, usually just a few degrees or 10 degrees, 20 degrees below is uh, incipient melting point to remove any segregation and, and to achieve the, the properties. So it is not a surprise at all. This very long pro uh, process um, can, can actually lead to uh, a very substantial scrappy rate. So in the past, I think this is around 10% of success, uh, success rate and then increase to around 30, 30%, 70%. And I think I've read some reports recently that a good casting house can achieve roughly 95% uh, of or uh, even higher success rate. But these are still very, um, very difficult uh, the processes. Maybe we can now try to answer the question why it is still very hard to design super alloys. On one hand, um, we have a very large compositional space, probably too big. Um, you, how we designed in the past is using a combination of experience, knowledge, and, and some intuition and, and luck, to be frank. And also there are many processing variables. You can change the withdrawal rate. Uh, you can control the, um, um, the thermal gradient and th thermal distribution in, in your furnace, different heat treatment parameters. So that the same alloys can behave very differently and the optima uh, optimization will take time for, uh, for higher success rate. The processing route, uh, of course, cannot be considered completely separately from the alloying uh, development and, and vice versa. So they have to also uh, match each other as well. Many types of um, degradation mechanisms are, are possible. These are very complicated and complex. They are not fully understood in the applied level and sometimes not, not in the um, fundamental level either. Uh, one of the examples I'm showing you here is um, uh, the review paper written by my colleague Sabin Sosa, uh, who basically listed uh, many models that is uh, describing the tertiary uh, creep um, in the in the past. And you can see most of these models are are very different to each other and trying to capture different aspects of the uh, of the material. Once you have um, once you have so many different models, uh, as as a hint that. There, there are a lot of um, things we, we have to, to understand. And of course, qualification of such an 
alloy is, is, is not easy because you can't afford it to fail. Um, the failures are uncontained. If they fail, then that means uh, the plane is probably going, to, um, probably going to fail as well. So these qualifications are going to be creep, fatigue, oxidations. These experiments can take at least days and you can usually take months, sometimes even years. A complete development cycle can take about 20 years. So this is a very time consuming process. It's hard to make it very, very, uh, very, very fast. Of course, now we have the economic considerations because you don't want your, your engine to work only once, but you actually want it to work 20, 30 years. So in terms of what we've learned from, 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 the, from the experience, I would uh, try to address this in, in the following aspects. For example, in science, we understand um, how um, the alloying is going to affect the micro properties, uh, mi uh, microstructures, and uh, the microstructure is going to inform and, and cooperate with the uh, processing techniques and also to convey the performance. So we have established this relationship. We, under we, we understand it uh, fairly well. We have also constructed a lot of databases. We have been able to make um, the observations of many phenomena uh, possible uh, by characterization instrumentation. Also, we can do the modeling and, and optimization of many, uh, many of the properties uh, quite well, and they can be guided to, uh, they can be guided, uh, to, to the technology development. In terms of the tech development, we have basically understood material selection and uh, processing route they, they have to match. Um, optimizing compositions and, and parameters can, can take a very, very long time because we don't really have any uh, tolerance to them. However, we, we also sort of faced a big um, issue is we, we are basically developing many things uh, into a marginal level rather than, um, rather than it was, it used to be like big breakthroughs because we are really, really close to, um, to the melting point of this class of material. And now we have to con consider more uh, economically in terms of the cost controls, etc. But luckily we can also transfer, uh, it's not only just about jet engines, it's also about outer technologies. We can transfer what have, we have learned into, for example, turbochargers in, 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 uh, in, in hypersonic vehicles. And these can be, uh, not, uh, these knowledge can be transferred to those applications. Uh, so that is quite nice. In terms of people and cooperation and practicalities, I am a believer in institutional cooperations. Engineers and scientists, basically, they are just different creators. They are so different. They are driven by different things, but they actually they have to work closely together. Engineers can figure out something initially, and and that is a solution. But you really have to understand the science behind it to optimize, uh, to optimize until it is it's really uh, viable and, and feasible. And of course, we, we don't want to design like 1,000 different alloys of, of super alloys because the qualification process takes very, very long. But we, 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 have to, we have to admit that um, we, we can never just try all of the compositions. Also, there is a lot more, um, frankly, we, we just don't know about that uh, we have to be um, we have to be a bit humble in terms of the um, in terms of the science and uh, technology. So, the question is, can we take some of those um, knowledge and to, to help our um, development of other process for some other technologies which are emerging? And one of these technologies is additive manufacturing. Um, I don't have to explain too much to you because you already must have heard something about it. Uh, it's basically there are two types of people, one becoming very optimistic, the other one is very, um, they're, they're very uh, skeptical about it. So let's do a case evaluation for additive manufacturing of nickel. So additive manufacturing is very important and, and, and is going to be quite beneficial when you don't have a lot of quantity to print. And also when you have when you have to change your designs multiple times because you don't have to change the um, uh, the toolings and 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 stuff. The other attractive thing is if you have your design to be very complicated, it doesn't really take additive manufacturing too too much to 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 actually build it. But it can be a, a completely disaster and even impossible for traditional manufacturing. On the right hand side, you can see this is probably the most. Uh, famous metal additive uh, application, which is a fuel nozzle 
designed by GE, you can see that 20 parts has been turned into only one part to be printed. And they have enabled some uh, weight reductions and material and the, the application is, is more durable. So all of these are, are nice and, and can be considered beneficial to the super alloys industry, particularly if you can avoid a machining, you can reduce the part numbers, and if you can also uh, redesign your applications, which is really attractive because many of the things we are doing at the moment, we're, we're making them in the way we're making them now is because we can't make them other ways. If you can redesign your applications, a lot of the assemblies, they can be removed. So how do we approach this? It's kind of like the chicken and egg question. Um, in the past, what we do is we come up with some compositions and we test their properties, but this may not be the most effective way. As we have learned quite a lot from, from the experience we've constructed the databases and, and models, we might have try to do this reversely, which you have your criteria for the properties you need that include, for example, uh, the strength, creep resistance, density, um, how, how stable a phase this is. And then you isolate from a very large design space to find what compositions might be able to do this job. And in this way, you can screen out a lot of compositions very quickly by a data-driven method. So for additive manufacturing process, we have also in, incorporated something about processing, which one end is the, the freezing range analysis, essentially the solidification cracking analysis. And the other end is the strain age cracking analysis, which is basically from the welding literature. If you apply some of these uh, criteria, you're basically left with a small um, area that is not so many compositions. And you can do a uh, Peruto uh, front uh, method to, to, to analyze what may be the best uh, suitable alloy composition that is in, in, uh, within the, the, the design scope. Therefore, um, uh, we have basically tested some of our alloys, including a ABD A50 AM and 900 AM, which we started A50 first and then 900. And importantly, because I, I still believe that extensive experiment has to be um, has to be done in, in terms of to uh, in, in terms of helping the, the design and, and and iterations. So we, we basically take these three alloys in Canal 939 and 247 LC them into test and see how how, how close we are about our predictions. So in, well, these are the compositions um, of, of the material. And in, in short, we have made everything consistent. We just wanted to find out what is the composition really is doing and how big this impact is. Try to convince ourselves since we're not um, additive people. We made powder in the same uh, size distribution. We tried the same uh, laser parameters. We tried the same build volume and strategies, et cetera. This is a binarized um, image of a CM247 LC uh, material. So um, you can see how many cracks there are uh, in here. And they, they're, they're just not good. You, you won't be able to uh, trust if your plane is made by this material in this method. But just to be frank, this material itself, if, if, if it is used by some other method, um, it can be completely flawless. So don't worry when you, when you get on the jet plane. But we know this is this method is not very good for CM247, which is a gold standard. Um, if we try them at different um, compositions, we can see that um, the new designed alloy composition becomes um, a lot easier and, and more forgiving to this process without too much uh, too much. Um, uh, uh, defects, uh, particularly these are, are not very, very critical, but just to be frank, the alloys we have designed in here uh, has got a much lower gamma prime fraction. So that means um, this is not going to be the most uh, heat resistant material uh, compared to the other other materials uh, which has got um, cracks. However, uh, that is that is a good start. And you can also compare uh, and do your DOEs and just to try what is the best uh, processing conditions for, for each of these alloys. And you realize actually these defects are basically quite um, 
um, the, the trend is not changed, even though uh, the absolute numbers may change with the um, processing window. In order to really understand and feedback our models, we have to understand exactly what happened um, in terms of those cracking. So we characterize some of those cracks in, 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 in our SEMs. And we found there are three main types of cracking we have to consider. One is solidification cracking, uh, second type like question cracking, and last, last one is the solid state cracking. So we have also tweaked our models and, and in, increase some, some other criteria to help us to screen out for the, the, the next iteration of our um, alloy design effort. This is basically the um, super alloys um, that are um, the, the, the microstructures. And very interestingly, you can see there is no um, gamma prime in the as fabricated state or as printed state, but they can be popping up um, after the heat treatment. We didn't really believe this in the beginning until we have uh, performed some uh, synchrotron studies uh, in, in diamond light source, which is actually uh, down the road there, that way about 20 minutes. So in the as fabricated state, you can't really see gamma prime being, being popping up by, the resol uh, by res resolving the super lattice uh, peak, but you can do it after you, you, have, you have a heat treated. This is also uh, reflected by the heat treatment um, um, hardness uh, compared to the um, as fabricated hardness. You can see um, the gamma prime really have increased the, uh, the strength of the material. So having the knowledge of, of these, we have um, tried to validate our material with another iteration. And short uh, story is we have uh, made it, uh, it's, it's not containing uh, cracks and we have been able to heat treat it as well to, de to develop a, a good uh, distribution of the gamma, uh, gamma prime uh, precipitates. Initially, we tested with our um, um, miniaturized uh, machines. Um, the, the properties are quite nice. And if we compare something that is apple to apple, which is comp containing roughly the same uh, gamma prime fractions uh, to some uh, good gold standard alloys in, uh, in Canon 939, you can see that um, the, the performance of the alloy is actually quite good until it's really, really high. And that is realistic, un unrealistic for, for its uh, intended application. Um, different things we have also um, tried to achieve uh, was to re remove um, the anisotropy of the material. As, as we have mentioned, just like single crystal, the 100 zero zero, um, orientation is the preferred um, orientation when uh, it is aligned with the heat flux. And this is usually produced uh, anisotropic um, anisotropic uh, super alloy by additive manufacturing. If you heat treat it in high enough temperatures, you can possibly um, trigger the recrystallization because of the inherent uh, high density of just, uh, GNDs. And then you can end up with a uh, le much less textured uh, material uh, by the promotion of, of, of that. Having uh, a part of the process to understand how good materials are, um, these materials were uh, tested uh, by third parties in ASTM standard. And you can see the, the properties are still quite, uh, quite good, uh, very similar to what we, we have uh, anticipated from, from our um, uh, miniaturized testing. And of course, for high temperature applications, you can't escape creep at all, uh, which is really important. Um, there, there are two benchmarks in here. Uh, one is in Canal 718, which is ad additively friendly. Uh, you can you can make in Canal 718 without too much uh, problems, but they are not designed for very high temperature application. They are very strong, but not very heat resistant. Compared to CM247, which is very strong in, in high temperatures, but they are just a, a bit hard to, to additively manufacture. And as, as I showed, there are a lot of uh, very critical defects that 
the presents in, in these alloys. So um, what we want in the ideal world is to have something as printable as 718 and they have um, the same uh, properties as 247. And in this diagram, which is called uh, LMP uh, or Lust and Miller parameter plot, um, the, the farther to the right, that means the better the properties are. And whatever these uh, numbers here are, are telling you is basically about one order of, of magnitude. In that regard, um, our alloys are not doing too 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 bad, and we, we are basically uh, approaching this this line um, to 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 its um, to its capa uh, capacity. Another val validation we have to consider, uh, particularly for additive manufacturing, is to scale this up. It's usually easy to print something quite small, but from the experience and literature and and engineering engineering applications, these materials has got too high and too 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 much residual stresses. And when you want to build them up uh, in size, they just become uh, the, the, uh, un undoable. They they contain they start to find uh, find find cracks. So. One of the things that the um, the, the company Alloyed uh, did is to um, to build such a um, liquid fuel rocket engine made by ABD 900 in partnership with Airborne Engineering Renishaw. I was also invited to see the firing test, uh, but I was a little bit of uh, afraid of COVID, so I didn't really go. But I, I received <laughs> such a picture um, some days later uh, of their testing, which is absolutely amazing. It does show that um, the, these works are, are are paying off and and can be um, can be used for engineering applications. Of course, it's important to address that all the uh, developments around the world. It's not only us just only doing this uh, type of design work. Also, um, allo design aspects. Um, a lot of work has been done in, in Santa Barbara, but for example, uh, cobalt nickel alloys. Or if you want to uh, incre increase the printability, you can try to coat it with uh, some nanoparticles, uh, which is inspired by by casting uh, technologies. And in, in, in the very cold place, such as uh, Link Shipping uh, University, people are trying to, uh, to make other, even higher gamma prime content materials um, by, by similar methods. And these can be similar to, uh, well, similar ideology, but different models, uh, including DFT or first, uh, first uh, principle calculations. Other exciting developments, including the process control, that basically just how to make your uh, how to make use of the lasers and and design uh, your materials. Uh, for example, uh, these important things have been done in Oak Ridge uh, and Tennessee. Um, you can you can basically uh, control to a certain extent uh, your heat source and and also your corresponding uh, microstructure and texture. One of the very in, in important progress, I think, in, in the field is also the success, uh, successful manufacturing of single crystals using additive manufacturing done by uh, Professor Kuna and her, her team of Germany, which is um, very exciting to me. Also, we are facing the technology improvement as well. Not only the lasers are just going to be like that, it's going to be improved. You can increase the, the heating pad, the heating plate. You can start from one laser to two lasers to now four lasers, the quad laser system. Um, of course, you can also try to provide different type of external field when you are when you are building um, these these kind of uh, materials. So the technology is also improving. In terms of application, this is probably the most um, exciting part. And I, I feel we have to mention um, that the NASA Mars rover uh, is actually carrying eleven parts um, of components that's made by additive manufacturing, including some nickel heat exchangers. And uh, the relatively space company um, has has done something absolutely amazing as well. Um, the entire rocket engine is 3D printed, and they did it in 60 days instead of normally two years. And they're 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 due to launch, I think, probably this year, which which is going to be a very big exciting event to to, to watch. So here are some take home messages I would like to uh, to pass on. If you have, uh, if you have, unfortunately, uh, fallen into sleep, please wake up now. <laughs> um, I, I would like to address 
uh, address that um, nickel super alloys are, are mission critical for high temperature applications, especially they can ima uh, enable the jet engines and, and rocketries, et cetera, this type of applications. The design and manufacturing of them are usually not easy. It's, it's not only just about strains or ductility, it's also about creep, uh, environmental assisted degradations, uh, these, these type of things. A balance of property has to be has to be conveyed by both alloying and, and uh, processing uh, advancement and certain trade-offs are, are usually necessary. When you want to design something very creep resistant, then you have to face this is going to be a lot more expensive and harder to make. Usually there are more than 10 elements are typically added to, to achieve the desirable properties to tailor some, some microstructures. And because of the vast possibilities, of the design space, it's just not possible to do the brute force method, trying each compositions out. Physical based models can guide design, but they have to be validated by experiments, it can shed light in, in reducing the number of iterations and screening out um, a, a, sm a much smaller uh, design space that is available. The field is also um, has has changed as well. Initially, it was driven by military bands, but now is evolving to more civil dominant applications. And we have uh, many other focuses, such as cost saving, uh, computational data driven approaches uh, to develop um, the decoding technologies, and and uh, very exciting uh, applications as well. I would like to uh, finish my talk by sharing you this um, anecdote of uh, Sir Frank Whittle, who was actually the, the father of the Whittle engine. Of course, he was too futuristic in his time. So uh, unfortunately, he had many, many setbacks and a lot of people didn't believe in him. However, his uh, perseverance has, has paid off and his genius design also um, turned out to be, to be working and important. You can see what, um, what these uh, Committee on Gas Turbine has, has wrote uh, in 1941, just one year before his success. They don't believe this is ever gonna work even with better materials, it's just not feasible. So the, the, the sort of the, the, the history or the story of Nico now it seems like quite um, successful and Nico is seemingly the best candidate. But actually I would like to remind or, or address that what's gonna happen again if, if, if the time is wind back, it could, it could have been steels, it could have been ceramics, it could have been refractory alloys. So I always take this, this um, development story of Whittle Engine as, as a huge iteration because the history is, is always biased by the, the survivors. But importantly, the new history will always, defined, will always be defined by what we do, and that is in our time. I, I sound like I've done a lot of work, but that is basically not true. It's, um, I, I would uh, really thank all my collaborators and, and colleagues from the universities, from the industries. They actually are, are, are amazing and, 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 um, and making all of these, um, some part of our uh, part of development uh, are possible. And also the uh, funding and support and and exchange from, from these uh, bodies and organizations and, and companies. So that is the end of my talk. I would like to um, uh, give you an Easter egg to, to guess who this guy is, who is completely um, famous. So I think that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you, Yuanbo, thank you, Dr. Han, for your nice uh, lecture. And I believe everybody gonna learn a lot of stuff by the uh, uh, about the super alloys from your lecture. So if you guys know the answer of uh, Tony's Easter egg, please just raise your hand to answer it. I'm gonna unmute you or uh, promote to uh, promote you to the panelist, or you can just type your answer to our uh, Q and A uh, board. And if, of course, if you have any questions or anything you would like to discuss with Tony or with Sholo uh, about uh, his about uh, this lecturer's work, uh, you can just uh, uh, raise your hand or uh, type your questions in the Q and board, and we're gonna help you to ask. Thank you, guys. Any questions, please?
So I do see one question uh, from the audience that asking in ICNEL 718 superalloy, we can have both gamma and gamma prime phases. And, but what, what is the best way to um, avoid the formation of delta phase or at least to delay the formation or the growth of it? Actually, the delta phase is usually um, some, some, some people call it as a heat anatomy. Um, basically that is tr sim very similar to uh, gamma double prime. Um, but they are usually a lot larger, and they're 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 usually detrimental. However, I think well, uh, the to answer this question in in a short way, um, you can basically engineer them out using processing uh, techniques, uh, especially using heat treatment con uh, different heat treatment conditions. I think this is quite uh, quite well documented um, in 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 many literatures. There there are ways of using heat treatment to engineer out. Um, these delta phases, but I would also want to try to answer this slightly differently because delta phase sometimes um, so from some of the literature that I read, they can actually be slightly beneficial if they can be used to control the uh, green boundary deformation and 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 to uh, to delay uh, to to strengthen the the green boundaries. So really depends on the application you're trying to. You have, the question you have to ask really is the what application and what performance you want to achieve, and if that phase and that microstructure is is going to be needed or not. Great, great, thank you. And we, we have another question from our audience that uh, asking that you have presented some of your work based on I believe a selected laser melting, which is one of the additive manufacturing processes. Yeah. So the audience is asking. Have you ever tried other types of additive manufacturing approaches to fabricate nickel-based superalloy? And can you comment on the uh, feasibility to um, employ other types of additive manufacturing method in the processing of, of superalloys? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it's very interesting if you compare, there are many different additive uh, manufacturer, uh, manufacturing technologies available these days. Um, powder-based, well, actually they have many names as well. So SLM or selective laser melting or powder bed fusion by laser is one. And these are probably, I think, the cheapest one. The, 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 the conditions are, are easy. You're using just a laser to melt. And what you can achieve is um, some very fine controlled, uh, precise uh, structures. But the Achilles heel is basically your material is, is going to be a uh, exerted to a very high thermal gradient and this is not really friendly to um, to um, super alloys. So the super alloy has really passed this test. But other method, for example, EBM, uh, electron beam melting, which is very similar to um, to SLM, but instead you're going to use um, electron beam to, to heat, heat up the material and to do this local um, melting, remelting process. This method can also be handled with a uh, very efficient uh, heating plate. And how high I can get in there is roughly about, I, I've seen reports saying about 1100 degrees, which is <laughs> completely burning. And in, in that way, you can, you can do your material uh, additive a lot easier because in, in that way that in, in that way that you, you have a, a lot less uh, uh, considerations about solidification cracking due to the thermal gradients and, 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 and thermal, thermal stresses. But the problem is that it's very, very expensive. And there aren't so many very good practices in, uh, around the world. Um, what one, for one example I gave today on single crystal casting was actually done in, in, in that machine. And you, I, I think it's quite difficult to do it um, in, for example, in, 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 in um, uh, SLM. Uh, other type of methods, for example, the, the direct, uh, uh, direct energy deposition, or some people call it blown powder, you're going to sacrifice with a bit coarser of your microstructure. But what you do is you have a heat source and you're throwing powder to it and, and you fuse them um, on the fly and or at, at, at that place. So the, the problem with that is you can't really build something very, very uh, precise because the resolution is uh, a lot higher. I may, I, I may not have an uh, example just around me, but 
that is usually the, the precision is about, I think, uh, one or two millimeters. The example I showed for relativity space, they are using, I believe, a uh, direction, uh, sorry, a DED, a uh, direct energy deposition method, because their whole engine is quite big and they don't really need to engineer, engineer out the, um, the, um, those, those very fine structures. Of course, um, with with other methods, it's also po possible, which can be um, which can be more related or similar to to welding, which is um, W A A M. I can't remember exactly what what that is um, what that is stand for, and it can also be something from just basically from from the um, welding um, welding community. You can basically use a wire based. Uh, additive manufacturing. So, so that is also possible. But again, you are making this material a lot easier to be adapted to this process, but you are losing the edge of making it uh, very, very um, precise and, and small in terms of features uh, compared to maybe 100 microns you can achieve in um, in, in, in the um, selective, selective laser melting. But the, the game is you can make them a lot faster. The deposition rate is faster, much, much faster. Yeah, great, great. So we have uh, other audiences um, raise several other questions. So maybe I will do that in chronological sequence. And I have seen Dr. Ping He raised his or her hand. So Dr. He, can you just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful um, uh, seminar and uh, I'd like to have a question for when we um, uh, design super alloy, uh, especially I see lots of uh, experiments and I also see your um, your um, design um, uh, analysis. So uh, I'm very curious about uh, if we use uh, molecular dynamics and uh, the um, especially when we reach the melting point looks like, uh, there are lots of uh, potentials that are not good for the melting melting point. So, do you have any suggestions? Um, so the question is about using uh, MD type uh, simulation to 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 work out, um, well, basically to help to facilitate the design process. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yes. Um, basically. There are uh, many, many different design tools you can use, and um, actually, people are doing that. Um, for example, it doesn't have to be MD, but it can be in in other scales. For example, DFT or first first principle calculations. And I, I believe um, MD is is one of the uh, the, uh, the front runners as well because it does capture the behavior of materials quite quite well. However. The real problem about these type of method is actually they're quite computationally expensive. So if you want to do a very simple analysis of a composition using, for example, let's say uh, thermal calc, uh, a calculation can be made uh, a lot faster than than MD simulation because you are dealing with a very very large um, design space. So what you have in 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 MD may be a little too expensive in terms of the initial screening for, for materials. But what can be done in my, in my view is you can use a hierarchical ways of design alloys, including in, in initially you can screen out some, simula, uh, some, some compositions that are just not very um, promising at all in, in terms of, for example, uh, densities or uh, in terms of your cost. And then you can do a, a, a slightly better, um, a higher um, level of um, a calculation such, such as um, phase, phase dynamics uh, to, to understand what phases might be in there using some more calculator to calculate the solidification passes, etc. And then once you have some fairly um, convinced um, 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 compositions, then you can run something more uh, computationally ex expensive. So I think it's actually how you can f uh, arrange it in, in to, to make best use of it. Thank you so much. Great, great. Um, I think the next question it will 
come will be coming from uh, Dr. Xiao Shang, um, who has raised his hand. And can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yeah. Um, hey, Yuanbo. Um, it's a yeah. uh, it's an excellent talk. Um, so my question is uh, uh, on one of your slides, you mentioned that uh, um, it's possible to make single crystals with uh, active manufacturing. So um, I'm wondering if you can uh, maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more about it, um, uh, whether it's material dependent and uh, what the technique did they use to uh, make the uh, single crystal with the item manufacturing. Right. Okay. Um, actually, that that's a fantastic question. Um, one of one, there, I believe there are a few groups has made has made this possible in, in terms of. Um, additive manufacturing of, of single crystals. And I believe first first of all, it is materials dependent. Some materials are going to be easier to be to be additively manufactured, such as MSX4, which is designed for single crystal uh, technology. And to make it, the thermal control is, is quite important. And, and also they have experienced a lot of these uh, processing uh, trials as well. So basically it's, it's kind of between the, it's between how you can, you, you know this, this way it's going to work, but how you, how exactly you are putting the lasers together. I, I have a lot of in, in, um, admiration, uh, um, uh, admiration to, to, to these groups because they have really experiment, um, ex, um, experimented a lot. The best, the best thing is probably actually um, also to read your papers uh, to to find out our secrets. But it's I I think personally it's 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 a very technological um, advanced method, and you have to involve the, the using of of the um, of the um, of the thermal thermal plate as well. And some sometimes you also have to heat up um, heat up this uh, the newest layer using using the electron beams many, many times until it achieves a very good thermal gradient and then mm, melt it. And then you control the, um, the, the control of, uh, uh, control the subsequent uh, solidification behavior. Okay, this, this, thank you. These are my understanding, but I, I'm, I'm not really an expert in, in EBM or, um, or EBM of uh, single crystals. Yeah, but that, that makes a lot of sense, uh, what you just said. Yeah, I'll definitely check out the papers. Thank you so much. No problem. I see there's a hand from Dr. Yu. Yeah, uh, Professor Yu Qing, you can just- Yeah, Professor Yu <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just to call me Qing. A very nice talk, and uh, thank you, Yuanbo. I so still much. remember we chat uh, a couple of days ago. <laughs> so it's good to see you face to uh, face. To yeah, face. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm very impressed by your um, talk when you're saying the quick performance of your addictive manufacturing nickel super is pretty good, right? So um, I would like, I'm more interested in, you know, um, two other mechanical performance, the one is thermal fatigue. So can mm -hmm. you comment a little bit on um, whether you are evaluating the thermal fatigue performance? And the second question is, can you comment on I'm um, in the category of the people who are skeptical uh, about the uh, manufacturing, especially their damage tolerance. So can you also comment on this aspect as well? Thank you. Yes, um, sure. Thanks, thanks for the, thanks, thanks for the very good questions. First, we, I've only showed uh, you some results on, uh, on creep and also high temperature properties. But as I mentioned, that is not the, only storage at all is only the things we prioritize to to test first because they they are just very very important and and we we have to get these right first and then also to optimize and test all the properties for example uh fatigue results um we have done some um some low cycle fatigue which hadn't been published but the results are looking quite nice because actually this material has, is quite strong, and that is also fairly useful to uh, to thermal mechanical fatigue as well. And and in, in other aspects, we are also testing oxidation resistance. Um, these for the results I, I've I've uh, I've seen and uh, that is done by, by by my colleagues, they are actually outperforming um, also the um, the other similar uh, materials that is of the same gamma prime content. So the development of these materials I think really can 
is 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 really facing another big leap because we we can't um, have them in well we we can have um, those materials in in such temperatures but we still wanted to push this harder and higher and, and in, in, in terms of higher temperatures so we are still trying to make more iterations uh, with with these um, with these um, with, with these alloys with adding more gamma primes which is also ongoing and the, the second um, the, the second question is on the damage tolerance this is very important because we have actually found a lot of trade-offs uh, when we have sort of learned in, in, in the hard way because additive manufacturing it first provides a lot of um, provides a lot of uh, bad surfaces and one of the one of the big hype about super alloys additive manufacturing is you can print your blade directly you can print your stuff directly without machining or without much machining which is fairly true but once you have printed you can see the surfaces they are just not so great they are not shiny or they're they're shiny they shiny they're shiny in, in one way but not really the the conventional way when you wanted to put it in, into service so um i i am also a bit skeptical about that but i think that can be sorted out by some other um type of um pro processing protocols including these are processes not only just hipping and and, and machining they're also um, some, some some work on making the materials con condensed and also using some chemical method to to re remove the the surfaces another another way of doing this can be can be done for example using uh, different laser parameters to we, we sometimes have something called border parameter which means once this is going to be a surface we have to use a different parameter which is usually a bit slower uh, a bit less power or um, you just wanted to make the surface nice and you can compare um, the surface roughness between uh, there, between an engineered uh, nice surface which we have applied water parameters compared to the ones we haven't and they 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 can actually give a very different result but you you are quite right um these has to be um taken into very serious considerations and particularly i think that it's important for the qualification people to decide what policy they have to make and and how do we qualify a material uh, that is done in this way particularly when you're thinking of making those uh, making those very fine structures it, well if you are just considering something big and simple in structures these are probably okay okay thank you very much yeah no problem all right i, I think your talk has raised uh, arise a lot of interest in audience um i think we have a few more questions from our uh, attendees so one of the um one of our audience asked about a uh, fast screening of promising compositions for super alloys especially considering the emergence of the big data um way of of of, of working on the research and can you comment on the feasibility or the challenges that uh, uh of applying machine learning for example to speed up the promising composition screening for super alloy development. Okay, now we have probably got um, all these um, buzzwords, machine learning, additive manufacturing, super alloys, or perhaps also later on, maybe some high tree alloys as well. Um, to, to, be, to be quite frank, I was also initially very skeptical to additive manufacturing. And until, if you, until you really have do the case evaluation and see, see if that is going to apply something nice to it. And I think the same thing happens with, uh, with machine learning. I do believe machine learning can, in some, in, in some part of the design process, can help with, with the, uh, can, can, can help to, to screen um, these, these, um, these properties uh, a lot faster than, than we're doing at the moment, just by just by um, just by um, physical based models. But the important thing is you have to know exactly what they are doing, what exactly exactly what the machine learning what what the machine is learning, and by doing that, you have to uh, or originally have a very good database before you can you can train your machines, and that really depends on where exactly you apply apply it to the design process. I believe 
I do believe machine learning can can really help the the the, um, the screening of the alloy compositions, but that has to be some particular um, progresses in in some in some part of the design. But I won't really rely upon just blinded uh, machine learning uh, development of 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 nickel super alloys because it's. It's 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 well, I I I'm 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 a kind of a believer on these things has to be based on physicals first. You have to understand what is what is happening. Great, great. Uh, thanks for all these nice comments. Seems like we have covered quite a lot about the general aspects for the technologies and sciences with superalloys. So I personally have two questions that are a bit more involved with the technical details. So the first question is. You talk about the importance of uh, creep deformation uh, in, in superalloys in terms of their engineering services. So my question here is, can you comment on the um, importance or the significance of microstructural evolution during creep deformation, especially um, the rafting processes during a uh, creep uh, be behavior? So what can we do as a first fa a fast filter to pick out those compositions that may or may not be able to sustain the creep rupture failure. And second is mo most of the, I think most of the current predictions of the rafting resistance on the criteria is mostly elasticity based on the famous uh, Frank Navarro criteria. So mm -hmm. second question is, can you comment a bit more on the involvement of plasticity in affecting the rupture uh, prediction or and also its mechanisms? Right. So basically, it's the, the both both of the questions are about rafting, and the first one is on the um, added to manufactured material rafting. The other one is more on rafting itself. Yes. So um, for for additive manufacturing, let's be frank, uh, we are a bit far away from from getting getting that sorted yet i that that is that is my my opinion because um there are different types of uh, super alloys starting from uh, the disc application 718 and then uh, guide wanes in, in a higher temperature and then the rafting would really um be become the the, the case we we care about when we are dealing with uh, very high gamma prime fractions and the current state of the art additive manufacturing laser based, we 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 are struggling to to get that uh, amount of gamma prime printed. In, in st so we, we haven't really um, reached to the the the, the rafting the, the rafting story of that yet. But I, I believe, um, for example, other methods such as EBM. Um, they have they have certainly have done a lot of work on on the um, on the um, rafting of for example additively manufactured single crystal although they can't make the the surfaces also single crystal but they can extract the cores and what they have found if I remember correctly is the the, the properties are, are basically completely comparable to the conventional manufacturer so if if of course, you have to, uh, once you have the material uh, built, you have to put it into subs a lot of um, different heat treatments before you can, you can get, that, uh, get that properties. But I, I, I think um, if, if you've done the other processes um, fairly correctly, then these, um, these, these roughing um, issues, well, these materials can be quite comparable to the conventional manufacturer. And on the rafting itself, that is a that is a really big question, man. That's so hard. <laughs> um, how do I? Um, I'm I'm not entirely convinced about the um, the the rafting uh, kind of theory as, as it presents, and and actually it's, it's still in a lot of um, debates. So um, I, I've also heard quite some uh, criticism in, 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 into uh, Professor Nabarro's um, uh, 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 mechanism. However, well, how do I, um, well, what do you think, Charlo, about that? So I think, um, I think the state of the art, as I learned from the literature, although I'm a bit far away from 
superalloys, but from a microstructure development perspective, current understanding seems to focus more on the involvement of plasticity into local chemical potential, which drives um, stress-driven stress diffusion processes. And most of these work involves with uh, plasticity is the theory was mostly developed based on discrete dislocation dynamics coupled that with phase field so that you you know that dislocation flux and local plasticity gradient and then you know the local chemical potential which drives the how the atoms are are are, di are, are diffusing are diffusing yeah so i think the current understanding and the state of art is as you say is um building up upon the Navarro's early criteria based on, on elasticity, but there, there's still a lot of way to do. And it's also a very hard experiment to perform, isn't it? Yes, yes, because rafting would achieve, I think in the third stage of-, of, of in, in the last stage of, yeah. of, of yeah. creep, and it has to be very, very high temperature. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and fairly low stresses. And if you go to a, a super alloys conference, you will be quizzed a lot about exactly how did you do that experiment. <laughs> okay, so I have a, a second technical question. So I've seen a few mm -hmm. high temperature tensile curve that you, you've seen you put in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the quick question is, how often did you see serrated plastic flow when you do a quasi static loading at elevated temperatures? I, I know some of the Superalloys shows this serration behavior at uh, intermediate temperature. So, how often are you seeing this in your experiment? It can occur. It can occur, but particularly when I have my um, material that is as fabricated, when there is little or no gamma prime in, in there, and if it also depends on the um, the, the temperature you tested. Usually, I in my experience that occurs quite often in about six hundred degrees. And it can be markedly improved or let's say uh, reduced at 700 degrees C or, or even higher. But the, the, the thing is, we normally are in, in, in interested in the behavior of material at about 700 degrees C or onwards. So that I, I, I personally don't see many of, of those, uh, those, those developments of separated um, of, um, plastic flow. And, and, and unless these are just made out of the um, as fabricated material and is really evolving quite fast when it's, heat, when it's being heated as well. Great, great. Okay, thanks a lot. And then we come back to the questions from the audience. So I think we have two questions left. So, but uh, I think here we're running into a bit of our time limit. So just briefly comment on these two questions. So. First one is on the feasibility of achieving single crystal using um, additive manufacturing processes. What are the challenges and potential uh, pathways that can facilitate this process? Oh, uh, so it's about um, single crystal additive again. Yes. Um, it's interesting that when I walked out of the, uh, the conference that Professor Kuna gave, about actually th now three years ago uh, on her work, uh, what, what I presented today, a lot of people were um, excited, but also they, they, they feel like, mm, well, in this way you can make single crystals, but how did you um, design out the polycrystallines that is on the edges, on the, on the surfaces? So you have basically made this possible, but disabled another very important feature by uh, not having <laughs> Not having um, not having this um, surface controlled um, so well, so I I, I think in, if if I'm um, in, if I'm thinking like an engineer, I believe that is something could be sorted out with um, with processing uh, based uh, trials or development. Let's let's put it in that way. You have to enhance the understanding of exactly how um, the the thermal distribution will be around these these corners and these um these um these surfaces, and then to control it. Um, but it from 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 the previous experience, this 
of course, it's going to 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 cause a lot of uh, problems. But in the same time, I believe it could also be possible that with a little bit of a, a machine, even even though it is if if it is not completely in that shape, it is still quite uh, quite encouraging that if you if you can really build it uh, in 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 large uh, scales and a bit of uh, machining, etc can possibly make this, I think, potentially very useful uh, for, the, for the future. Great. Uh, I see uh, Professor Shi Teng Zhao raised his hand. Uh, seems like he's um, also involved. So Professor Zhao, can you unmute and ask the question? Hi. Hi, Tony. Uh, hi. Uh, very impressive talk. And thanks, Shalo, for giving me this opportunity to ask a question. Well, it's actually not a question, it's a comment. Um, the comment that um, since Chao Yi is not here, the comment is, I think your London accent is much better than Chao Yi. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my whole uh, comment. Uh, well, I think this guy's already give you lots of hard time. So uh, uh, very nice talk. Um, thank you, you so know, much, Professor John. It's very important materials. Uh, when you talk about new material, right? I mean, I, I guess every day there's millions, millions of new materials. Um, giving birth to in, in, a, in a lab, but very few of them can go through markets. And, you know, we are blessed to have a nickel-based tube alloy. And I think 50 years from now, people are still using super alloys. Um, that's, that's, you know, I think Charlotte is working on RH, R, refractory based high free alloys. I don't know uh, if that's going to make to the next generation <laughs> super alloys. I mean, but everybody in the community are working on that. Um, well, I guess probably this is the last question. Do you think, you know, refractory high entry alloy will be the next generation super alloys? Tony? Uh, yes, well, this uh, yeah, is- I have the same question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> This is sort of the uh, I think that that's the comment I, I made in the in the very end. I believe the future is what we depends on what we do. There has been a very big rush like like now on on HEA uh, in in the fifties to design um, high entropy sorry uh, to design refractory based alloys to replace nickel super alloys and and right. and, and unfortunately they they failed. And if you read um, the very important paper made by uh, Chester Sims uh, in 1984, he commented that um, even though it's died, the, the, the program is died, but it's probably, it's very likely to uh, reassure again, like it is now. So people are, are getting a lot more interested. To be honest, when you think retrospectively of the history, um, a lot of things are happen, right. has happened completely by chance and by whatever that is you know available at that time and 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 many things i in my in my view are are fairly random even though you can justify their existence now easily saying well you know it's it's, it's not an accident but actually history is, is what happened um as a string of accidents so i i believe in people making this possible rather rather than something is just right or wrong. So I, I'm, I, I believe it's, it's, it's possible if we can really solve the, um, I, I think there may be at least two Achilles heels that I, I know of. One is um, them being very brittle and the other, the other one is being, being very uh, susceptible to, to uh, for example, oxidation. Um, right. So, so I, 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 I'm, to, be, to be frank, if, if you have um, in, enough, energy and 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 expertise and and luckily with funding and 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 a strong heart i i don't think um nico has to be the 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 only front runner of of these applications so that, that i think that is my answer well terrific terrific It, oh, right. it, it is an excellent uh, question as well. I, I believe that is a question of many people. <laughs> good, good. I think we have one last question from the audience. So can you briefly comment on the design period of, of additively manufactured super alloys that, ex ex that are exhibiting application worthy properties? Oh, um, 
we can take actually um, our sort of uh, case. Uh, it's, it's actually, again, a, a long process, depends on which kind of stage you think you have, if, if got it. Um, if, if you wanted to calculate, um, if you want to narrow down a sort of a composition um, by applying uh, different criteria to your design space, these, these kind of things can be done in, 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 in a couple of months, or if you're efficient, even faster, if you're a PhD student, maybe, maybe slightly longer, but they can be done in, in, in that kind of time scale. And that is probably the, the first step, right? Yeah. Once you have come up with a composition, how do you know that is really the, the case? Even though we have a lot of empirical data, but it is a new composition and we don't want un, un, unpleasant surprises. So you have to make it, you have to test it, you have to test it many, many times because the first one is usually not the right one. And um, I, 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 in my in my understanding, the, the hardest part is actually to make it pro, to process it, because once you have presented your uh, your proposal to a manufacturer um, to make the, those powders or to to make these materials, it takes much much longer and and more difficult than you than you normally would think and afford. They will tell you this is probably not possible or it's going to cost you a lot of money and once you have done through that process and you and to be to be very frank in my case for the work that i presented today uh we realized actually they didn't uh, do it as well as we think in the in the first goal they they sort of put too much boron carbon in in the material and you know that is going to uh, make it completely unusable and we we came back to them can you reduce them next time please we really need them to be right uh, they tried and 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 they they just completely removed boron and carbon, which is not what we wanted either. So that kind of process is is beyond just science and engineering, and and these kind of process are again a little random as well. And once you have gone through that step, you have to find the optimization of your material, and you possibly want to re re release a pat, uh, patent application, and you want to have your uh, IP protected. Or well, you probably wanted to do it much before that, but that is also the other part. And then once you really have your material tested, you know, um, you're happy with it, how do you convince the end users that this is useful for them? And are they really willing to, are they really willing to help you to, uh, to test this out? Or they think, well, you have done a fantastic job. This is the best thing we have seen in, in the market, but we don't need it. Or we... It's, 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 it's not as good as we, we, what we need for what we can do with con conventional processes. So we are not going to waste the time. Um, <laughs> so you can, you can see these, all, all of these are the development cycles for um, su successful application of, 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 of such material. It's years time. And I, I, would, I, would, I would tell you the truth. I, I would never ex expect to see um, uh, one of our um, alloys we designed together with the company Alloy uh, Alloyed um, has been has been tested even though that I, I'm not involved in that work has been tested uh, in firing and that is I, I thought it has to be like when I'm when, when I have my grand grandson so um, so these are these are a lot of random things in, in here and it's a cumbersome process. Good good. I think then I'm, I'll uh, leave the host to Dr. Chuan in, and probably this is the end of the part for the technical discussion. And thank you all very right. much, Dr. Tang, for the nice presentation and all the wonderful answers to the uh, questions raised by the audience and also myself. Thank you so much. And thank you for the sniper question. I haven't really answered you. <laughs> <laughs> so if uh, there's no other questions, uh, yeah, I will just like to thank again, thank Shalo for coming here to co-host this event with me. And uh, also thank all our panelists, uh, panels. And uh, of course, the most importantly, thank Dr. Tang for giving this very uh, excellent talk. So uh, we probably will end up our uh, lecture today. So looking forward to see you guys in our next talk. Thanks for the invitation and your time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a nice weekend. Yeah.